Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the NJTV Agnes Vera Studios. It is our honor to introduce, this isn't one-on-one, -on -one, this is one-on-two, two, two very special guests. Matt zoller Seitz is, uh, and also Alan Seppenwall. They are the TV critics and co-authors connected to the 20th anniversary of The Sopranos. This book is called The Sopranos Sessions. These guys have been writing about, studying, writing about The Sopranos from day one, 1999, when the series uh, broke on HBO. They've been with us many times in the past. They're the best at what they do, and you honor <laughs> us. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. It's our pleasure, Steve. Um, Matt, Sopranos happens in 1999. Yeah. Who, other than David Chase, thought it was going to be something really special? Not even David Chase thought it was going to be something <laughs> Not really special. Not even David Chase. Well, he originally wanted to do it as a movie, and, and he, uh, he did it somewhat reluctantly as a TV series, and he never thought it would last beyond season one. And, in fact, it was going to end with uh, Tony actually strangling his mother, and it was only when, when Nancy Marchand asked, can you please keep me around the sh on the show, I need the money, that, he, that Livia lived. And Nancy was sick. Nancy she Marchand had cancer, and he knew that she had cancer when he cast her. So another ending. Geez, I don't remember the ending. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Your healthy obsession with The Sopranos started yes. when? Uh, basically when the show started and when Matt was covering it for the Star Ledger for the first couple of years, that was the most envious time, the most fraught time in our partnership <laughs> together because he had staked a claim and he realized immediately like this was the show that was going to change television. And you said, hey, yeah. let me in on this. And after season three, he did. And I got to cover it all the way through the end, through that finale that people are still arguing about. By the way, I want to make it clear that not a lot of people in our business are that generous and open yes. to and if we're, we're not turf focused. Yeah, um, you yeah. would have pried that show from my cold, dead hands, Steve. <laughs> you, it was lucky that it was you and not him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here's what I want to do. But by the way, the 20th anniversary is significant. Why? Well, for one thing, the show is a period piece now. And it plays very differently when you go back and watch it again. And it was it was a great pleasure Which, watching. Excuse me for interrupting. Both yeah. of you went back to watch every episode again. We right? did, yeah, more than one. And most episodes, more than once, yeah. Yeah, because the book has essays on every episode in addition to the new interview we did with David Chase. So we had to revisit all of it. How open was David Chase? By the way, originally from New Jersey, David Chase, how open? Uh, more open than at times than we expected. Less open at other times. Chase is always a challenging interview subject. He doesn't like talking about the show. He doesn't like explaining things. But there were times when he would just get on a roll. And he start like, we talked about the last scene in the ice cream parlor for, like, almost an hour. Yeah, as I was reading about that part, <clears throat> did he, did David Chase make a mis... Uh, did he say something unintentional when he called it the quote-unquote death scene? No, because uh, he was referring to what happened was after the fifth season, the executives at HBO started asking him, how do you want to end this? And he came up with this idea of uh, Tony is going to a meeting with Johnny Sack, the New York mob boss. And you By the way, check, excuse me, uh, check out our website, the interview with Johnny Sack, uh, whose Vince name Curitola. is Vincent, Cur Vincent Curatola with a C. Check that out, one of our favorite interviews. He talks about Gandolfini as well. We're yeah. about to show you Michael Imperioli, who played Christopher Maltesanti in just a moment. But, but set that up again. Okay, so... Sorry for... That's aggressive. okay. That's all right. So, uh, where were we? I'm sorry. T Tony's driving through oh, the... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So... The how are you going to end this thing? The, the HBO executive asked David Chase, how are you going to end this thing? And one idea, this is an early idea that he had, was Tony was going to drive to a meeting with Johnny Sack, the New York mob boss played by Vincent Curatola, and we would see him driving and we would see him going through the Lincoln Tunnel and then it would fade to white. And you could draw the conclusion that perhaps he didn't come back from that meeting. Well, that's eventually not what he did. And part of the reason why he didn't do it was he thought it, it was, even though it was subtle, it, he didn't want to give people the impression that, oh, he died and that's the end of it. He wanted something that was a little more infuriating. And as we know now, he did come up with something more infuriating. Yeah, and by the way, for those of us who live in northern New Jersey, if you've ever been to Holton's, uh, an iconic yes. ice cream joint in Bloomfield, New Jersey, that booth... Yes. The booth where um, Tony Soprano and his family were sitting, I mean, that is a very special, there, there it is. Yep. Wait, hold on. That's you guys. That's yes. Us. We, they filmed, you got the onion rings. Yeah. They filmed a documentary <laughs> where we talked about the show and ate onion rings while doing it. Yes. Oh. Yeah, it's an hour of us talking about the Sopranos at Holston's. It's called uh, uh, My Dinner with Alan. Oh, I love That's it. That's the title By of the way, it, yeah. no, not a commercial for Holston's, but they do have the best... Uh, on your rings around. Um, can we show some pictures of some people? No, why don't we do this? Let's do the Gandolfini thing. Oh, by the way, I can tell already, we're going to go along with the guys, all right? So can we make an adjustment on the fly here? James Gandolfini. <clears throat> so many of the people we've had on 
from the cast have talked about the kind of human being, not just a great actor. Talk about being generous when you're yes. talking about your colleague. He's a great person, great human being. Yeah, and he was ve a very reluctant star. He didn't like talking about himself. The first time Matt was trying to do an interview with him in the first season, Jim called Matt's house and got on the phone with his wife trying to ask her to get him out of having to do it, not because he was aloof, but literally he just didn't like the attention, which is an odd way to feel if you're going to be the star of a television show that changes television, but that's how it worked out for him. When the, when the first season was going to premiere, uh, he tried to attend in a yellow cab. He didn't want to take a limo because he was afraid that his friends <laughs> would see him and think he'd gone Hollywood. And by the way, I said talking about a Jersey guy. He's Jersey yeah. guy, Rutgers guy. Mm -hmm. he's not, he, I remember he'd always root for Rutgers. You know, yeah. He's a big Rutgers fan. Um, yeah, one of our editors went to, went to college with him, and he, you know the dent in his forehead? Yeah. Uh, he gave him that. Is that right? Yeah, Slammed Mark, the door in his face and had to take him to the emergency room for stitches. Mark, Di Mark Diano, Pulitzer, Mark, Mark, Pulitzer oh, finalist Mark for the Diano. Star Ledger, grievously injured uh, James Gandolfini. By the way, we're going to have Mark back on because he has a new book coming, a new book out. Um, yeah. By the way, you guys from the Ledger all did really well. Yeah, uh, we did. Some okay. of them are continuing to do well. C can we do this? I'm going to show you. Can we show the clip from Michael Imperial? I keep talking about it. This is a clip from the Tish WNET studio. It was a one-on-one -on -one interview with uh, Michael Imperioli, who played the nephew of Tony. A soprano, Christopher. I believe he's talking about uh, James Gandolfini and, and his experience with this incredibly iconic series of Sopranos and 20th anniversary. Let's go to the clip. I did not know Jim, and a lot of us didn't. He, um, but he was the central character. He worked more than any of the other actors, pretty much. And he was also like the captain of the team. You know, he was like the, the Lou Gehrig or the Derek Jeter. And he looked out for everybody, both behind the camera. And, and financially, I heard. Did he fight? And financially, well, he was an extremely generous guy. He, you know, he would find out about, like, some woman who's getting evicted or couldn't pay her mortgage, and he'd send someone over to check completely anonymously. And he saved a lot of people and helped a lot of people who probably to this day never know he did that. I mean, you can talk about Gandolfini forever. Talk about um, Michael Imperioli. Talented. Right? Well, he's he's a sharp guy. I mean, he's a really, really well-read, like genuinely intellectual person, and very, but d very down to earth too. And I used to love talking to him when I would visit the set because he always, you know, he was always reading some new book that he wanted to recommend. He'd just been to a play and he wanted to Pretty talk deep about guy. it. Yeah, he's very lively, like you know, with his mind, like always looking for the next thing. Let me ask you this: Can we put a picture up of um, is Carmela Carmela Edie Falco? Yeah. Put a, Talk about Edie. Edie Falco is amazing because it, it was such a contrast between her and Jim. Jim ha you sort of had a hard time shaking off that role. Edie Falco was like an acting machine. She would walk onto the set. It would be like flipping a light switch. Suddenly she was Carmela. She could be going through the most intense dramatic scene you could possibly imagine, screaming her lungs out. And then the director yells, cut, and she's back to being Edie Falco, and she's talking about what she's going to do that weekend. Can we talk about Dr. Malfi, um, Lorraine Bracco, who I remember, we all remember from, uh, my wife sometimes jokes, and I, she says, do you have any money on you? You know right. what she does? Yeah. I say, well, how, how much money are we talking about? She goes, you know. And she does a thing, Karen. Yeah. yeah. From, from the Goodfellas. Yeah. Just a little bit, right? You guys can't yeah. see my Karen. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's such an insight. This is inside, but you appreciate yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. She goes from that yeah. scene yeah. to playing a Jewish woman who lived across the street, Right, and and she comes into this crazy world in Goodfellas, and she's Dr. Jennifer Melfi, and she's Tony Soprano's psychologist or psychiatrist, right? Yeah. yeah. Did you ever, ever expect that it would be that powerful, that part of the whole Sopranos thing? No, and I certainly didn't expect to see her playing a part like that. And that was part of the genius of the show is that they often cast people against type. I mean, not always. There are times where, like, Frank Vincent showed up playing exactly the kind of role you would expect Frank Vincent <laughs> to play. But in a lot of cases, they were casting people in ways that showed new sides of them. And I think Edie Falco is an example of that. I mean, she had been a really successful indie film actress, but sure. she'd never played a part that was that had that many layers and was that sort of constricted and, and kind of constrained in certain ways. By the way, uh, check out also our website, steveoutabotter.org. Put it up, because our interview with Frank Vincent from back in, I think, 2010, 
My God. He wrote a book called The, the Wise Guy's Guide to Being a Wise Guy. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Talk about <laughs> just it's it's so inside, but I enjoyed it. He, he uh, read for Uncle Jr. and basically didn't get the part because Chase worried he was hiring too many people from Goodfellas. And yeah. Frank said to David, look, I, I understand I'm not oh. getting it this time, but you're going to have to hire me sooner or later because there's only so many guys like me for a show like this. OK, since you mentioned yeah. Dominic Cheney's. Yes. yes. OK. Uncle Junior, yeah. how many people know, you guys know this. Yes. He not only was in Goodfellas, but look at Dominic Cheney's with um, Jamie, Jamie Lee. Yeah, Jamie Lee um, How about this? In Godfather, go ahead. Godfather part two, Johnny Ola. Johnny Ola. Ola. Yes. Johnny Ola was, oh, never, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> did, did you realize right away that Uncle Junior was Johnny Ola from The Godfather back in the early 1970s? Did you realize it right away? Oh, yeah, because I was a Godfather nerd. You know, I had the, the, I had the, scene in I had the VHS cassettes <laughs> where it was, they packaged them as two cassettes because the films were so long. And yeah. then Fredo said, yeah, Johnny Ola told me about yeah, this place. Exactly. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the great thing is, uh, we, when we talked to Chase for the book, we asked him, like, wouldn't Tony have taken out his uncle after what happens in season yes. one? He says, probably, but Uncle Junior was our favorite character to write for. <laughs> we loved like, putting these lines in Dominic's mouth. There was no way we were ever going to kill him. How much does Dominic Chinese love singing? <laughs> he loves to sing. He sings even when, even if nobody asks him to sing, he'll sing. He loves to sing. It's He's good great. Stuff. He's great. And you know, he got, he started out, uh, he became a fa fascinated by show business because he went to see Sinatra play at the Paramount Theater in, you know, right after World War II. And he was, I was a teenager. Say right about early, uh, mid 40s, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. By the way, the name of the book is The Soprano Sessions. Matt and Alan have put together a powerful book a in a conversation with David Chase is in here. So the whole idea is after these episodes, you provide uh, your analysis of it? Yeah, so you can, if you're watching the show for the first time or you're rewatching it, you can watch an episode, turn to that chapter in the book, read what we had to say about it, and keep on going, or just bounce around. If you want to read about Pine Barrens, oh, go for it. Oh, jeez. I, I, yeah. I asked Christopher, <laughs> I, asked, I asked Michael Imperioli about that. Remember the shoe came off? Was, yeah. I lost my shoe. <laughs> oh, when they're eating in the... Never mind, I'm sorry. That also has one of my favorite Uncle Junior lines, which Go is ahead. when he, when uh, 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 Gloria throws the London broil at the back of Tony's uh, yes. neck when he's leaving. Yes. And then a couple of scenes later, he goes to see Uncle Junior, and he's talking to him, and he pauses it. He goes, you've been eating steak? I'm not, and, and by the way, I'm not going to talk about the scene where they're out there golfing. <laughs> I'll leave it, can we leave it alone? Yeah, yes. sure. We'll leave it alone. By the way, the, the movie, the 20, 15 seconds on the movie, really? We're doing a movie here? Yeah, Many I mean, Saints he, of Newark, it was called. He's been talking about this since the show ended. But it's called Newark. Now, now it's just called Newark, Now it's yeah. called Newark. It's a prequel set in the 60s, dealing with Uncle Junior and Johnny, and especially Dickie Moltisanti, Christopher's father. And hold on. Uh, Gandolfini's son is in this? Yeah, he's playing Tony. He's playing young Tony. Yeah. Probably yeah. sometime in the 70s or early 80s. <sighs> you, what can you tell us about it before we see it? Well, we don't know anything about it. Like he was actually, he had he had uh, finished a script a long time ago, and he he knew full well what it was, and he probably knew when we interviewed him that it was going to go into production, and he didn't say. Yeah, anything. Yeah, I asked one thing, and he said, uh, and he answered for about two seconds, and then said, "I've said too much. I need to stop talking." He did not really. Yes, yeah. I guess one more character. Do you remember we had Furio on? Yeah, yeah. we had Furio because we showed his artwork. Federico yes. Castelluccio. Federico Castelluccio. Yes. yes. That's a talented artist. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. a lot of people on that show who were not really actors. He was one, Steve Van Sant. Even Vince Curatola was a masonry contractor before he wound up on the show. Guys, I cannot thank you enough. Not just for this book, not just for, for those of us who live in New Jersey and follow, you followed your work in the ledger for all those years. You made this experience of watching this more insightful, more powerful, more interesting. And uh, by the way, let folks know where you are today so they can check you out. Uh, I'm at Rolling Stone, and you can find me on Twitter at Seppenwall. I'm writing about TV for New York Magazine, and I review movies for RogerEbert.com, Roger's old website. Wow. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank, thank you. The name you. of the book again is? Always a pleasure. The name of the book is The Soprano Sessions. Indeed. Matt and uh, Alan have put this together uh, in conversation with David Chase, forward by Laura Lippman. Thank you, guys. This is one on two, and uh, <laughs> The Soprano's 20th anniversary. Never be another one. When I grow up, I want to be a top chef. When I grow up, I want to be a CEO. When I grow up, I want to be hungry. No child wants to grow up to be hungry, but that's the reality for one in five children in New Jersey. Join the Community Food Bank of New Jersey and end childhood hunger. We need your help. You can feed our future. Feed the future of New Jersey now! 
also brought to you by Atlantic Health System, building healthier communities. And by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey.